Kurzweil, I think, answers that criticism with a great definition of what human beings are, which is that we overcome boundaries. We're boundary overcoming things. So where there's something that is stopping us, we figure out a, a way around it, over it, through it, or a way to transform ourselves to achieve whatever the particular overcoming may be. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephen Parton, and you are listening to The Feedback Loop on Singularity Radio, where we keep you up to date on the latest technological trends and how they're impacting the transformation of consciousness and culture. For this episode, we're doing things a little bit different as we take a look back and highlight some of the best segments from previous episodes. This time around, we're going to be focusing specifically on our three comedian guests who each share a deep passion for all things Singularity. This includes Stephen Fry, Duncan Trussell, and Reggie Watts. We're going to start things off specifically with comedian, actor, and author Stephen Fry, who was our 20th episode, and whose love of ancient mythologies provides us with a foundation for our conversation by looking into the lessons of the past. Specifically, we pick up in a part of the conversation where Stephen Fry was explaining how the Greek titan Prometheus stole fire from the gods and gave it to the humans. This is what gave humans the godlike power of consciousness. And this greatly upset Zeus, who wanted the humans to stay as simple playthings that needed the gods in order to find that divine spark. And on that note, here is Stephen Fry. We are now at a new Promethean age, and never before, at least as far as we know, have we been in such an interesting situation, so akin to that of Prometheus and Zeus. There are people who will say it's nearly always 30 years. We know the cliches about AI winters and how it's always 30 years ahead. But there is, as your podcast title helps us remember, this idea of a singularity, of a moment when some compendium, some mixture of biologically augmented humanity, gene edited with new materials, controlled by quantum computing, and with the latest in robotics and AI, will create entities. We'll call them that. Robots is a word that's confusing, and pure AI is too kind of too broad an idea um, stretched across so many different servers and countries and so on, but entities could certainly be produced without uh, anyone thinking we're fanciful, who reach a phase of intelligence that is enough to suggest that that spark of self-consciousness might arrive, that that moment might arrive. And here in the world, people like you and me who are interested in this development, people like Elon Musk, of course, and others who have their own views about the dangers or the excitements of this coming tsunami of convergent technologies, which will all build towards this moment, this singularity. Um, and some of us are Prometheuses who say, Let's give these creatures the ability, these entities, the ability to think for themselves and actually to have a sense of intelligence akin to ours, that to, to, to spark a consciousness like ours, to give that flame. Let's do it. And others like Zeus will say, no, we can't. If we do, they won't need us anymore. They will just regard us as a strange organic mess in the corner to be to be dispensed with, just as we dispensed with the gods. What I'm curious about is where you fall on that. Do you think the, the Greek myths have guided you to fall towards the Promethean side, the Zeus side, or are you staying in the middle, perpetually agnostic? It's a really good question, Stephen. And I think anybody who's who's tried to look into this, this, this question of, uh, of artificial intelligence for any length of time is, if they're honest, is likely to swing one way or another. Part of us out of sheer intellectual curiosity and excitement belongs to the Prometheus camp that wants to see what can be done 
um, that whether we can, you know, shout like um, Victor Frankenstein and, you know, as Boris Karloff, it's alive, you know, it, it, it's, it's that feeling, that amazing feeling that we could be midwife to a whole generation of extraordinary intelligent creatures who become more and more intelligent at each iteration, each pass, of course. That they, um, and then another part of me, of course, is very, very frightened, is, is at least... There's the possibility of absolute destruction on the, at, the, at the hands of these creatures, which I think, I hope and believe we're sensible enough to be able to forestall in, in various ways. We can set ourselves important, clever puzzles. And, you know, people like you and, and, and others, uh, you know, right up to the great Ray Kurzweil himself, you know, are very good at, at writing quite simple, apparently simple rules a bit like the Asimov rules of robotics, you know, which are quite simple, but, but very important as establishing protocols. But as I say, whether, whether the whole world will obey them, and that's the thing, we imagine some mad East European or whatever, whatever our racist propensity that drives us to, to believing is the most dangerous part of the world. Some evil genius could easily be in London, let's be honest, um, uh, uh, who, who just doesn't, who doesn't obey the rules uh, and who is just too excited to see. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on how the interplay between culture, language, and technology is unfolding. Are these cultural narratives, are our public dreams, are myths currently creating a technology that is maybe undermining the best of our human potential? Or is the technology, do you feel the technology is potentially driving us towards creating culture? that is undermining? It's a very interesting question. I mean, I think that, that there is an obvious reciprocity between technology and the arts and language and cultural considerations. Um, and I can't remember who it was who pointed out that it's a, it's, a, it's a very good way of looking at this, is that the very language we use to describe, for example, the mind, uh, is really dependent on our technology or what is around us. So when St. Augustine was writing about the mind, he wrote about canyons and ravines and peaks because he looked out of his window or his cell and he saw little more than, I say little more, it's enough. He saw nature, he saw canyons and ravines and mountains and streams. And so his metaphors were always that of, um, of consciousness as a river or um, and of mountains to be scaled and peaks and so on. And then a little later on in, in the um, sort of 19th century and so on, as the machine age took off, the mind and the, it, it was seen as a machine, as, as something rolling cogs, literally the cogs are turned in the in the mind because suddenly that was a metaphor we could take from technology and apply it inwards do you think that we can create a, a new myth to maybe help unify us do you think there are ideas that we can put forth to maybe help right, right the ship as we navigate this transformation into a potentially promethean uh artificially intelligent future <laughs> it's it's a very interesting idea isn't it because the, the the last thing we want to do is to is to break through the the membrane separating us the now from this from the general intelligence singularity at a time when we are most opposed to each other when there are new cold wars and new walls of misunderstanding between cultures it would be a disastrous time in particular it would be lovely to think we were unified Historically, when has mankind ever been unified? Well, we don't know because we've never been mankind in a global sort of McLuhan sense of the global village, all you know, all aware of each other before. Uh, so you can talk about times when individual cultures have unified, and that's always, almost always, I think, because there's been a threat, uh, an, an outside threat, either in the form of an invade, invading people. Uh, or a, a disease or a famine. Uh, it's the, the, the horsemen of the apocalypse, essentially, are what unite people. Now, in a positive way, the more podcasts there are, the more people talk, the more people exchange ideas, the more people push 
on the frontiers of of neuroscience and computer science and 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 um, you know uh, artificial intelligence science and all these other sciences and philosophies the more people do that the more chances there are of smart ideas variants popping up which might well blend with other variants, which might produce coherent and credible and verifiable ways of looking to our future in a, in a manner that will save us, if you like, just by talking. There's a huge amount of hot air and most variants will stumble and fall, will not be, as a, as a biologist would say, viable into the next generation. But some might just have legs and be able to walk and talk as ideas in new ways. And now that we've explored a bit of the mythological history with Stephen Fry, we're going to jump to an exploration that deals more with the present day with comedian Duncan Trussell. In this conversation, Duncan tells us a a bit about the lessons that he learned from Singularity's co-founder, Ray Kurzweil, and how difficult it currently is to navigate contemporary issues such as the handling of free speech on social media, and the losing of our ignorance as the internet exposes us to information that had otherwise long been hidden. And now, Duncan Trussell. One of the things I find most fascinating about you is how you reconcile some very interdisciplinary fields that I don't see a lot of people mix, like shamanism and magic with a K, you know, like yeah. Aleister Crowley type magic with Buddhism but also with this really deep love of the rawness of human, the human spirit mixed with transhumanism, which is kind of negating that in a way. Like how, how do all these things mix together in your mind or what's the relationship there? I don't think transhumanism necessarily negates the human spirit. I think that's a misunderstanding of transhumanism. And I think when like I, I have it on my phone somewhere, Kurzweil has a wonderful definition of human beings. I wish I'd memorize it, but it's something along the lines of we're, we, what we like, because one of the worries people have when it comes to transhumanism is that it is going to redefine us to the point of being no longer human. That's the idea. And, and I guess that's where the anti-spiritualism stuff goes along with it. And th- so when people think that, I understand why they think that, but Kurzweil I think answers that criticism with a great definition of what human beings are, which is that we overcome boundaries. We're boundary overcoming things. So where there's something that is stopping us, we figure out a a way around it, over it, through it, or a way to transform ourselves to achieve whatever the particular overcoming may be. And so as long as that spirit is within us, regardless of our particular external form we would still be by at least his definition human being so i think that's a beautiful way to look at it and i think that is one of the most spiritual definitions of humanity that i could think of you know it's we're, we're talking about the um you know the creative outflow of consciousness into time and right now it looks like us but to answer the question regarding like it being natural if you look back at all the other periods of dna's expression into reality every like these periods one period versus the other versus the other it's apocalyptic i mean whatever you know the if you look at like the lemur creatures or whatever we apparently are all related to versus us now and you told those lemur creatures look this is what you're going to turn into they would be like we're fucked yeah are you kidding we're doomed what how do we stop this you know so uh, I think it's a na- the the difference is if we're talking about eons. Or I don't think it's I don't know the definition of eon. We're talking massive scales of time, and now we have this hockey stick problem. So we're having to deal with it before our very eyes. And that what what could be more anxiety provoking than that? If you find yourself really attached to your idea of what a human being is, and especially if that idea is marked by uh, having two arms and two legs. You said anxiety provoking, but I heard you in a podcast uh, a few years ago, I think, say something like um, the current generation isn't lost or anxious. It's that they're having to come to terms with too much truth. Mm. Like the old institutions were dying, I think, like 
it's kind of alluding to the fact that like religion doesn't really, we don't have faith in religion as much anymore. We don't have as much faith in our government. We're seeing things with smartphones that are happening on the street every day that we were able to be ignorant of. And maybe now technology is revealing new truths. I mean, do you think that's kind of what we're still dealing with here with the hockey stick problem? Well, first of all, technology is the connective mechanism that's allowing those truths to get distributed around the entire planet for better or for worse. And um, we're, we're having to confront all, you know, so many fascinating problems now related to that, which is you, for example, freedom of speech, you know, you, what a beautiful idea, incredible and, and perfect and, and, and really like, uh, shows like a deep love and, and trust in humanity itself that, uh, you know, we can handle all forms of data that where a human being is capable of hearing complete bullshit and, and, and not being warped or mutated or set back by it. But those ideas of freedom of speech, they were, it was coming out at a time when like the mechanism for distributing information was limited to the speed of the printing press. Mm-hmm. Or the tell it the the you know that was how you would get it out to everybody, or a bullhorn or something like that. You know the speed of sound, I guess. Like however you could amplify your voice in arena, you know. And so suddenly we leap forward, and now it's like you can instantaneously transmit any message, you know, regardless of uh, it's how true or false it may be, or the intent behind it to the entire planet instantaneously. And so now it's like oh fuck well we you know wait how do we deal with how do we reconcile this beautiful idea with the undeniable truth that they're incredibly seductive manipulative very very dangerous people who you know they're all i'm saying is like there are definitely people out there who have malicious intent in their vocalizations that that are, are, are more than just wanting to shit disturb like there's people out there who just get off and hurting other people with their voice and so how do you how do you reconcile that idea in technology as it is right now so you know these are challenges that we're all facing but the but to answer your question the way that all of this is happening the way we're seeing what it was really going on in this on the streets or the way we're seeing seeing what really happens during a war the way we're seeing all this stuff that was hidden behind a veil uh is via the you know the internet and and so yeah it's it's what's a it's like in what's interesting i'm sure you know this apocalypse literally means the lifting of the veil and mm. that veil is being lifted uh by instantaneous access to information that was hidden behind like it just, literally in filing cabinets like you would have to break into a building and open up a filing cabinet and look at an old black and white picture and shit your pants it, it, we're just we're dealing with like acceleration here and we have to be more nimble we're not nimble we, we're too slow right now in dealing with things like this everyone's pissed at the tech overlords as they call them for like you know like because they don't know what to do so you've got you got you know Trump theoretically like a, potentially starting a fucking civil war from tweeting and you know it's people at Twitter or just like you know anyone and they're like what the fuck do we do we don't want, we didn't make this to start a civil war we didn't make this to like get people murdered or beaten in the streets or or killed or that we made this so people could connect we don't know what to do pull the plug that's all they could do basic just fucking pull the plug on it that because you know what I mean? That was yeah. they were just trying to act quickly. They were trying to be nimble. It was maybe it was blunt what they did, maybe, but they didn't know what to do. And I think we can expect again blowback because you pull the fucking plug and now there's a class action lawsuit against them. You know what I mean? Fuck. God, I would hate to run one of those companies. Oh, yeah. God. I mean, we, for, we forget that the people behind these companies are just flawed humans who make mistakes, who get sick, who have breakups, who have family members who die, who don't have the answers to the universe. They're dealing with this omniscient super technology where they get to control the thoughts of an entire species. Like they yeah. don't have the they're, they're not equipped to make those decisions. The best philosophers and monks and spiritual leaders and teachers throughout the world would struggle to answer that question yes it's horrible i can't fucking imagine it it's like it's it's 
to have to be at the helm of any of those ships, you know, whether you're, it's like one person or a group of people or whatever, is just no matter what, people are going to be mad at you. There is no way to do that without like if you just let all right, we'll just let anyone say whatever the fuck they want. Go ahead. What you want? What do you want to do? You want to upload that uh, video of your girlfriend tap dancing on living hamsters because that's what gets you know go ahead fuck it no have fun no we're not going to control any of it anymore go ahead we're done go ahead no go ahead we're not going to stop any of it no go ahead go oh you want to upload the fucking how to like use refrigerator coolant uh you want to upload a kid a video made for children about how to drink refrigerator coolant go ahead we won't stop it go ahead freedom of speech freedom of speech right like then you do that and everyone's gonna be like shut them down shut it down right now you can't you have to control it you know so it's like it's a horrible predicament to be in and i think a lot of those the people running those companies they are they they have like a, a utopian intent Mm -hmm. They recognize what I think all of us who, you know, fall in love with like Kurzweil's philosophy, uh, they recognize within it, like, holy shit, this could be one of the pathways to a harmonized planet. And, and this really could be one of those ways they see that, that, and that's why they're into it. And then, oh no, oh no, suddenly they're thwarted by the reality of like, a massive, massive amount of people on the planet with massively different ideas. The final comedian that we'll be looking back at is Reggie Watts, who explains some of the current paradigms of advertising online and then brings us into a future where he talks about how basic income and an engineering mindset can help assuage many of the struggles that our species deals with. This segment that you're about to hear starts off during our conversation about Watts app, which is Reggie's personal app that he uses to share his content with the world so he doesn't have to use other social media platforms. And with that, here is Reggie Watts. Was there a drive behind it that made you not want to use like traditional media like websites or youtube or other things to promote your stuff like what was there a drive that made you want to make it an app that's kind of more under your control yeah i mean i guess you know facebook buying instagram i was i knew it was going to turn to shit and it's mostly it functions but i i use it very basically you know i i've always used it like i use tumblr it's just a chronological display of my life as i move forward on occasion i promote something but it's mostly just like these are things that are happening in my life so i can look back and go oh that's crazy but um so i use it that way and i and and some of the other functions like stories i guess i i I use that for a long time i was like what the fuck is this it's like you know there's only so many so many ways you can slice audio and video you know and claim that it's new so, um, so it, it is a little annoying in that they're always trying to like, they, you know, they look at somebody else's thing, it becomes popular, then they copy it directly and then try to implement it just to kind of keep engagement up and then sneak ads in there to sell shit. So that, that part kind of gets a little tiring after a while. Um, and I'm sure there's great people at, at Facebook, you know, I'm, I'm, it's just a, it's just people at the end of the day. Um, so I'm not faulting people. It's just also just capitalism, but, uh, I wanted a place where people can go and see my stuff and know that they don't have to worry about any of that shit being tracked or, you know, their behavior being logged or like an ad popping up. Um, You just open the app and that's what it is. And that's all it is. So you don't have to, you don't have to worry. Just a place to relax and see my stuff. Yeah. Do you feel like we're going in a bad direction with that stuff right now? I mean, are you optimistic about the way things are playing out the ads? I know you were in that film creative control, for instance, that, had uh, uh talked about people with ads like coming in and invading people's experience yeah um and that's a real struggle right now but are you optimistic about it uh i think so i think it's a growing pain i think we're i think it's like you know we're like tweens moving into teens when it comes to technology we're still kind of pretty primitive 
uh, the you know the way that Facebook and others are monetizing the internet is very very primitive and kind of low bar thinking. It definitely generates a lot of revenue, obviously, to keep innovating technologies, but it's driven by capitalistic uh, a, a capitalistic engine, which many would argue like, well, that's just how that's how you generate money. But you know, I think subscription based models are going to kind of become a little bit more popular, especially if someone creates a really good service that that is easy to use, connects people really easily, and it's subscription based, and you don't have to worry about ads or any of that shit. And they, they maybe they'll track like uh, the stats and things like that just to kind of improve things like internally for the for the app, but it's never used for selling information to advertisers and things like that. I think that that once someone cracks that, it'll be great. I mean, it's like essentially a Netflix model, right? It's like Netflix ran ads they they're doing great so there needs to be a social network that is subscription based um you know and or instagram could kind of fix that by just becoming subscription based and just do like a an instagram i hate to use the word plus but you know something 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 like that where you're like oh yeah let's just do you know or uh you know youtube did that i was really happy about that when youtube did youtube premium i mean they're still like obviously collecting data but at least i don't have to see any ads because that's, that's my biggest enemy in the world is seeing an ad, and it's gotten bad too, man. It's gotten really bad, right? I mean, it's yeah, I mean, like it's like twice a video. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, or, or you're talking about YouTube. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I can't, I can't do it. Or Spotify, you know, like when someone doesn't have a Spotify Premium account, and it's like you'll love these new napkins. They're blah 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 blah. Now back to your music, and then it's like Tame Impala, and you're like, what the fuck? No, I'm not. Doing yeah, you that. just really killed the vibe. I'm not doing that shit. I can't do it. So I think safe space social networking is going to be a huge deal, I hope, or at least a, or a small deal for people that care. But I, I think that that's the way we're doing it. I think that the ad based stuff, it's like, who cares? Like, I get it. Like some people are like, I actually like it. Cause it actually does give me things that I want to buy. But then again, how many things do you need to buy? Like yeah. you have it, if you have a problem and you want to solve it, just look it up online and then find the solution and buy that, you know? But like, I don't think this idea of just casually like doing your social networking is like, Oh, a uh, sweater. That's cool. I'm sure that, you know, people have bought things that they're very happy with and the algorithm provided, you know, some things like that, but I would just rather not. Yeah. I would think that if you wanted it enough, you wouldn't need the reminder. No, you wouldn't. It's like, oh, it's like a point of purchase or something. Oh, better get this gub. I mean, it does work, but I just, I just rather not, you know, or at least have a huge control over what you want to see and, and put it in another section. Um, I just, want to have more control over how, you know, cause uh, Instagram as you know, it's like they, they change their interface all the time. It's like, where's that plus button? Oh, now it's at the top. Now it's not at the bottom. Oh, shopping's at the bottom. And oh, this motherfuckers like everything. It's like every day I'm expecting, Oh, we're now, where did they move a function? Now, now what are they copying? What did they add now? Like what, what other shitty thing are they put? Are they, they have the, the, you know, the Midas touch of shit, you know, <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, man. And, but they're like, but we're on top. So that's, with we have to use us yeah, the, you don't have a choice yeah you don't have a choice but so i hope that there's like a challenger out there that's like no we're doing subscription based everybody's loving it and then of course instagram will copy it because that's they don't have original ideas at this point so it's they're like looking like oh what else is oh yeah that let's copy that uh so i don't know i hope something like that happens and maybe maybe i'll make whatsapp that place uh uh, I, you know, I think people will have fun. Like if you could do all the same stuff you can do on something like Instagram, um, but you never see an ad and it feels like you have way more control over the way it looks, you know, the way your profile looks and all that stuff, a lot of customization. I mean, I think people would really dig that. I think. How do you feel about things like uh basic income in terms of like switching up the, the market forces? Oh, I love it. like that. I love yeah. that. Universal basic income is great. It, it makes sense. Like, I mean, essentially, everything should be looked at uh, through the lens of engineering and efficiency. Um, and and but with the premium, the lead being the lead metric uh, is um, human well being. So that needs to be a value that's in in inherent in the system. That's what we're. That's what it's it's for. It's for that. Um, as long as it's for that. Uh, then it only makes sense that people's basic needs should be taken care of. What people do with that income, if they want to blow it 
or if they want to like invest it wisely or they just want to use it what that's that's up to them they can you know people can still fuck up but at least they're given the opportunity to at least play on a beginning level field uh that provides housing water food you know you can pay your rent those those types of things that that makes sense to me and that only makes for a more efficient society than the the less that people are struggling the more that they can use their brain power for things that are going to advance us as a human race and people can actually take the time when you when people complain about like environmental issues or social justice issues we environmentalists and social justice people definitely go too far they they they, they like go so far that they end up turning off the people that they want to turn on which isn't good their the intentions are great but they go too far too extreme too militant and i understand the exuberance of youth and all of that but it's um it doesn't work it, it just you know you're just like <laughs> it's just an echo chamber like you're like yeah you guys feel this way yeah i feel this way it's like yeah those guys suck yeah those guys suck and then the other people are like you guys think that we suck and we think that you suck it's like well that's not gonna that's not doing anybody any good so i think when you kind of equalize the playing field when people are less are in less of a survival state, uh, then things start to get interesting. People can kind of mellow out from their extreme positions and be looking for more compromises and realize that, that we all are looking for solutions for the same things. If you do solve those inequities, man, all those kids that are like super starving somewhere, imagine if all those kids had food to be able to have the energy to think and to dream and to work collaboratively and people are sharing their ideas. I mean, every po- problem could be solved. I mean, we yeah. right now we we have a waste of brain brain resources. Like we're huge using waste. Barely any of it. It's crazy. That's one of the reasons I'm a techno optimist, man, is because I feel like if you could use technology to do something like a resource based economy or to do something complex like basic income and to help manage that huge scale of a project, then you can say, hey, look. Here's your food, here's your shelter, and here's your belonging. Everybody accepts you. We're taking care of you. And then immediately you lose that whole sense of like, they're going to take my job, so I need to fight for a more a bigger job. I need to go online so and, and become famous and make these like certain kinds of TikToks and be this certain kind of person for people so that they'll follow me so I can become an influencer. Mm-hmm. Like you can get rid of all that motivation and that person can just wake up and be like, how can I be the most badass version of myself today? Yeah. And then give that to the world. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree with you. Yeah. Techno optimism. Yeah. It's, um, it, I think, and I've always viewed it that way. I mean, I remember doing a gig for Microsoft. I think I performed in front of like 18,000 Microsoft engineers in Las Vegas. Um, some like, you know, internal, you know, kind of, uh, I think it was some maybe Azure. It was like an Azure cloud thing. Anyways, were they lively? Were they a lively bunch? You know, they're <laughs> they're engineers. You know, they're they're just engineering around. They all have their railroad hats on. No, um, they, uh, you know, it was like it was in a, a sports stadium, so it had like the huge jumbotron. So they had like cameras on me, and I was like on the jumbotron. And I remember at one point, I just I said, uh, I was like, remember, uh, there is no problem that cannot be solved by all of us, and especially you. Um, engineering mindset is kind of like, to me is my favorite mindset because all it is, is problem solving. That's all engineering is. Yeah. Uh, what's the challenge? What do we want to achieve? How do we achieve it? What's the best way to achieve? Oh, it's like collectively decide on what iteration, Oh, this isn't quite working, but we do keep this from this last iteration and we'll iterate again. So there is like a, there's a, I mean, engineering isn't necessarily like people are like, yeah, it's such a blast being an engineer, but but that mindset of problem solving is so much fun. I love like going out in the world and going like, oh, this is how I can. I mean, I have bad habits too. Like, you know, I'll do stuff in traffic where I'm like, ah, oh, I didn't really like that part of myself, what I just did there or whatever. You know, it's, but if you're striving to look out for people that need help and, and help when you can and don't make a big, you don't necessarily need to make, I think people think it's all, it's so all or nothing. It's like, I have to be mother Teresa or like I'm, I'm nothing, you know, I have to be uh Gandhi or I have to like go work for Greenpeace and like, you know, almost drown trying to protect whales. Like there's such small, it's all scalable. It's like, if you're just a nice person in your neighborhood that puts your garb, your neighbor's garbage cans back on the curb and closes them, that's fucking rad. 
You know, if you see some wrappers, you know, in a forest or whatever, you know, just pick them up and put them in your pocket and throw them away later. Or, or, or there's like your annoying, <laughs> your, your neighbor has like a gardener that comes by that's like using a fucking gas powered leaf blower and which, which I've done this, but like, and then I just buy an electric leaf blower and I go here, can you just use this? Just like solve, you know, I'm just like, oh, this, try this instead. Or I saw there was a, uh, a waitress the other night who was writing and it was like a really dark club and she was like using the candle on the table to kind of like see stuff and I'm like ah, you know they make this thing called a pilot's pen and it has a light on the tip of the pen and it's not too bright it's just bright enough so that you can see what you're writing and you can use it a little bit like a flashlight for a menu or whatever and she was like oh shit and then she like looked it up and like ordered one on the spot and I'm like some people just don't they don't think of things to make their lives easier so if you're the type of person that is an optimizer, you know, and not an intrusive optimizer, but like, you know, someone who's like, Hey, would, would you try this and see if you like it? That's how I am. I'm, I'm so yeah, I, yeah. that's my style of problem solving or talking about, you know, the fact that you can do this on a platform. Um, is sometimes people are like, I never really thought of that. Like, yeah, it's like, there's so many things you can do every day to improve the world around you in a very small, very doable way that doesn't make you feel like, you know, I didn't do it. I didn't do enough good today. You know, like it's not a competition.